Hello, everyone. Welcome to our little talk. Um, so obviously, as you've, you've seen from the title here, we're going to talk about something pretty exciting, uh, which is um, consuming Mac OS compute uh, inside of Kubernetes. Um, so this is something that we're, we're super excited to talk about. So today, um, you'll be hearing both from myself and from my co-host, Madri. And so we're respectively um, you know, working at the companies that you see up here. Um, and so a little bit about uh, myself and Flair to kick things off. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Flare. So uh, you have to forgive me for looking up at the screen. There's no mirroring here. So um, yeah, a little bit about Flare. We're part of Bazel's um, Experts Program, which is a community program organized by Google um, to sort of connect uh, you know folks in the Bazel ecosystem with expert help. Um, so uh, you know we do a lot of Bazel consultancy, uh, working with a lot of large organizations. Um, another thing that we do is we actually offer um, some value-added services. Uh, in sort of a SaaS or infrastructure as a service model to folks using Bazel to build and test applications at scale. So we'll dive in a little bit into Bazel. I, I won't go too deep. I don't want to bore you too much. But um, you know, suffice it to say, Bazel is a, is a great build tool um, that you know, connects to you know, remote clusters to do distributed builds. Um, and that's you know, sort of the focus of my company, Flare. Um, and so you know, one of the challenges here is we build these big distributed systems to do distributed builds. We also have to deal with um, sort of unifying lots of different compute uh, types. So, you know, for example, Mac OS when we're doing iOS builds. So um, there's a lot of underlying complexity here to the product that we're building. Um, and so we're, of course, thrilled to have uh, partnered up with Alodal to help us with some of the underlying infrastructure stuff so we can really focus on building out our product. Um, and so with that, Madri, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Madri. I'm founder of Elotal, uh, makers of Nodeless Kubernetes. Uh, the vision for Nodeless Kubernetes is we have transitioned from treating applications as pets to treating applications as cattle. The vision for Nodeless is to do the same for compute, so not to have pre-provisioned always on compute that's hand curated, but compute that comes up and disappears according to application lifecycle. Um, so it falls in, uh, it works in two levels. The first level is at a single cluster where you just have a, uh, a Kubernetes control plane that is deployed and no compute that is pre-provisioned at all. The right sized compute for the pod comes up when the pod starts. So if an iOS build is scheduled, a Mac one metal instance comes up. And if you want an ARM uh, compute shape for your app, an ARM compute comes up. And it could be in the shape of an on-demand spot or Fargate launch type on AWS and similarly for other uh, cloud providers as well. And it also works in commoditizing workload clusters in a federation of workload clusters. So you can have policy-driven um, uh, application scheduling across multiple workload clusters. So you're not treating individual workload clusters as pets. So having said that, I'll hand it over back to Zach to uh, go over more about the problem statement. Great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, quick TLDR on Bazel and distributed builds. Um, so like I said, you know, Bazel is um, Google's open source build system. Um, from, some of you may be aware of it, I assume. Uh, it was used briefly, I think, in the Kubernetes project, uh, although I think they hit the eject button on that at some point recently. Um, so this build system is universal, extensible, and fast um, if the parameters are right, and that's where Flare comes in. Um, something that is a little lesser known about Bazel is it has great iOS support um, and broad adoption um, through the Mobile Native Foundation, um, and there's a lot of great work in in the community to sort of make Bazel, you know, sort of the de facto for building large iOS apps at scale these days. Um, and so another feature that I already touched on is that Bazel has what we call remote build execution, which references a set of APIs that are baked into Bazel to allow um, basically the Bazel client running on a local machine to work as a scheduler and schedule actions across a big distributed uh, worker farm. And that's, again, that's what Flare is working on. So um, yeah, actions executed by the Bazel client might run either locally Again, and this is a CI agent or um, a local developer's MacBook, for example. Um, or these actions might actually run remotely, and this would be where Bazel is sending those actions into the cloud to execute them. Um, and then most importantly, maybe um, some actions are just not executed at all because cache results are heavily reused. So um, like I said, this requires a server implementing a few of the remote API protocols, um, and that's what we 
we offer. Um, and one really important anecdote here is that these Mac remote actions really need to be running on Apple hardware. So um, it might be tempting to, to try to run these actions on some Linux hosts, and there's some, some emulation and things that folks are looking into. But um, really long story short, these actions are meant to be run on Apple hardware from a licensing perspective, if nothing else. So that's, that's really important for us. Um, and so that's sort of the centerpiece of, of course, the talk today. Um, so, you know, we, we launched this company, you know, just a few years ago. So right around, uh, the time that these, uh, new AWS Mac one metal instances were coming out. Um, so of course, you know, we're super excited to see this, um, you know, especially when we look at folks building iOS apps at scale, this means potentially, you know, no more big messy closets jammed full of Mac minis. Um, you know, there's, there's fast provisioning now, um, you know, in, in theory without limits, just a, a AWS resource quotas. Um, and so this is great because of of course, provisioning new um, Mac minis can take quite a while if you have to set these up in your own data center. Um, of course, AWS is well known for auto scaling. Um, we have that in scare quotes here because that's up for debate. Uh, but in theory, this is this is a, a feature that's that's provided. Um, and then, of course, you know, standardizing the DevSecOps um, on AWS is awesome, rather than dealing with, of course, any other infrastructure providers or bringing your own uh, hardware. Um, so yeah, so like I said, these instances are great. Uh, we're, we're super excited to have launched our company requiring Mac compute right when these were available. Uh, but there's unfortunately still a few shortcomings that we had to sort of overcome, especially in the earlier days here. So, um, you know, I think the first is the pricing model right now, um, even with committed use discounts, uh, the pricing, as you, you can see clearly here, uh, is a bit extravagant. Um, you know, when you're when you're dealing with you know a large number of nodes, especially. Um, so this is, of course, one of the biggest sticking points uh, that a lot of people have when it comes to adopting these Mac Minis. Um, they're expensive. Um, Another issue is that there is actually some hard limitations on auto scaling. Um, so one of these is, of course, the 24 hour minimum allocation. Um, so if you kind of squint at that, really what this is saying, well, that's not really auto scaling at all, right? Um, so, you know, when we turn on a machine, we're stuck billing in 24 hour increments. So we don't want to turn on 10 machines just to turn nine of them back off and still be billed for the 24 hour period. Um, so as a result, what we see is these instances are often underutilized after we scale them up. You might hang them around for another 23 hours after turning them on. Um, one of the biggest issues right now that we see using sort of out-of-the-box tooling is just that the uh, existing autoscalers are really, they're meant for Linux, and they're just not a good fit uh, for the shape of the Mac compute. Um, oh, I guess I should explain the graphic here. Um, so this is actually a uh, production um, uh, screen grab, of course, uh, from a an instance running as a CI worker, a Mac OS uh, metal instance running CI jobs. So we can see here, of course, uh, the jobs are coming in. We're spiking up close to 90, 100% CPU. But unfortunately, there's just these big areas of the graph that are totally underutilized, uh, which is, of course, one of the big challenges that we would like to address because we don't want to just you know be burning CPU cycles, kind of like they mentioned in the keynote. Um, so um, yeah, so with these Mac One Metal instances, of course, um, management became a whole lot easier, but it's still not easy. Um, some, of, some of the issues folks working with these instances will have already run into is that, of course, even the smallest changes to the AMI might take hours to bake and deploy and roll out to all of your machines. Um, also, again, configuring the auto scaling, uh, for example, for CI and remote build workers that, that we're working with is still fairly complex, even with um, you know, the AWS primitives that we have in, in Terraform, it's still uh, can be a bit of a challenge. Um, obviously, we've got this big Terraform template. We need to get all that stuff just right, set up all the auto scaling groups, all that. Um, still not super straightforward. Um, so to, to sort of recap on some of the problems that we've seen uh, at our company while adopting um, you know, the, the Mac compute is really, uh, one, configuration management. While it's easier, it's still a challenge. Two, uh, auto-scaled instances are underutilized and they're also expensive. And then three, you know, what about Bazel? Um, so some solutions that we've come across here uh, working in this space would be, so for, as far as the configuration and management, um, well, you know, why don't we just go ahead and use Kubernetes, Kubernetes and cloud native best pra practices to manage these uh, AWS Macs. And so of course that's where Lodal's solution comes in. Um, and then secondly, you know, auto-scaled instances are, are expensive. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the hacks that we have here is actually utilizing the, the same workers both as uh, the CI runners, so the CI agents that might 
might be hooked up to a CI solution as well as executing the Bazel remote actions. And so that way the underutilized CPUs can now be uh, you know, joined in and, and work as part of the remote build farm when they're not actively running CI jobs. Um, and then, yeah, what about Bazel? Well, now that we've got this sort of unified compute, we don't have to have a separate pool of, of workers running over here for our Bazel agents, then another one for CI agents. It all just runs on the same infrastructure, all managed under Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so kind of a, a quick a quick look at how you know the solution sort of evolved for us. So of course, if you're if you're working on you know, doing iOS builds, you should probably have a CI system. So of course, we stop start up here with that as sort of a bare minimum. Um, you know, running CI CD on Mac One Metal instances is really awesome. Um, these instances are fast. They're a little they're a little costly, but they're great. Um, and then sort of moving moving up a tier, um, you know, of course, we see using Kubernetes to manage these CI CD workers uh, on top of that AWS Mac One Metal. That's that's pretty great. Uh, and then you know, for us, of course, Total Galaxy Brain would be uh, Kubernetes managed CI CD workers, uh, sort of in, is running in conjunction with those Bazel remote agents. So here, of course, at the bottom, we've kind of got a, a quick look at the whole stack, uh, where we're running again the CI agents, um, the remote build execution workers, um, all of that on these great new Mac instances, all managed by Kubernetes. Uh, and that's where we are today. Um, and so with that, I'll go ahead and hand over to Madri to talk about some of the benefits of using the solution. Thanks, Zach. Um, so when Zach and others wanted to consume Mac 1 Metals on AWS, uh, we wanted to do an objective evaluation of, hey, do we really need Kubernetes here? Um, we are all here for KubeCon, so we, are all, we all love Kubernetes, but for an end user, we wanted to do a thorough evaluation as, is this really required? Uh, is Kubernetes really required to ma for managing these Mac 1 Metal instances, or is manual management good enough? So we did benchmarking along four dimensions. The first one is great full termination of both the build agent as well as the compute node. The second one is build agent configuration and ongoing operations. And the third one is auto scaling of both the build agent as well as the underlying compute. And the fourth axis is how do you reclaim uh, bad nodes, which happen to be a, a more frequent scenario on um, for Mac 1 Metal instances as co compared to ARM, ARM nodes or any other GPU devices or any other kinds of compute. So let's Go into the details of each of these. Um, let's start with graceful termination. So, for build agent, if you want to gracefully terminate it, if you're if you're managing your Mac One Metal nodes manually, you would have to configure EC2 lifecycle hooks, and you have to maintain these lifecycle hooks, and you have to constantly monitor and edit these lifecycle hooks, which is huge amount of overhead for operations teams. Whereas with Kubernetes, we all know that if you are running a build agent as a Kubernetes pod, even if you get a termination notification, um, the workload that's running inside the pod will uh, will complete before the pod is gracefully terminated. So you get that out of the box with in a Kubernetes managed system. And let's move on to graceful termination of the nodes themselves. Again, if you are managing your Mac One Metal computes manually, you'd have to create, configure, manage, and update your EC2 lifecycle hooks, um, and it's tightly coupled to your build agent. Whereas with Kubernetes, you uh, you are able to cordon off the node and you can drain the node and you can uh, you can gracefully terminate the node. So you get a lot of these graceful termination requirements for both the workload uh, build agent as well as the underlying compute node out of the box if you use a Kubernetes-based system. Uh, next, let's talk about build agent config. So build agents uh, would need certain kind of config information for where your log files are located and stuff like that. So if you're, man if you're manually managing your uh, build agent on a Mac 1 Metal, you would have to bake this config information into the AMI at creation time. And during ongoing operations, if you have to update the config, you will have to provision a brand new node and update the config on that node and, uh, and create a new AMI out of it, and then you have to churn all of your existing nodes with the new AMI, which is huge amount of overhead for operations team. Um, with respect to uh, if you're managing it using Kubernetes, you are automatically able to do it uh, uh, using Kubernetes, so you get much more ease of uh, operations for the config management because you can use config maps and secrets to pass in the config information. So you simply have to update your config map and secret and uh, roll out 
about a, a new deployment for your uh, build agent. So it's it's a super easy op operational simplicity associated with the build agent config management. The third dimension is auto scaling. So we wanted to also evaluate how auto scaling of the build agent pods can can work in a in a manually managed Mac on Metal uh, scenario, and how auto scaling of the underlying compute would work in a manually managed versus Kubernetes managed scenario. Um, let's look at um, auto scaling of the build agent first. So if you want to configure auto scaling of the build agents, uh, where you would want to scale up the build agents based on pending jobs in your build queue and scale them down based on uh, reduction in, in uh, pending jobs or during nights or weekends when your build workload is going to be minimal. You'll have to create auto-scaling groups and you'll have to expose the metrics from the build agents uh, through CloudWatch and you'll have to configure your uh, expose metrics through CloudWatch through a Lambda function or something in, and plug it into your auto scaling group. So it's it's quite a bit of operational overhead involved in, in setting up all of these plumbing um, networking in place. Whereas with Kubernetes, uh, you can have an you can have an HPA that is configured to scale your um, your build agent pods up and down based on your uh, based on your build workload. So you already have the the infrastructure in place. You simply have to create a brand new HPA um, and Let's look at auto scaling of Mac One Metal instances. Again, it's tightly coupled in the manual scenario to the build agent. So you'll have one to one correspondence between build agent and Mac One Metal if you're manu manually managing them. Whereas with uh, Kubernetes and Nodeless Kubernetes in particular, the auto scaling comes out of the box because based on uh, pending jobs in your Kubernetes cluster, Nodeless Kubernetes cluster will spin up new nodes and scale down new nodes, and it is cost aware uh, and it's aware of the 24-hour billing cycle of the underlying compute, so you, you're able to get auto-scaling out of the box as well. The last dimension is bad instances. We have noticed anecdotally in most of our uh, customer deployments that Mac One Metals have non-trivial amount of bad nodes in the in the available fleet that is made available by the cloud provider. Um, one such anecdote is in September of 2021, we, no we noticed up to 10% of the nodes spun up weren't really functional. And uh, if you if you were using manually, if you were managing your Mac One Metal instances manually, you would someone had, have, would have to notice that, hey, my bill provided, uh, my, my bill failed, and have to triage the failed build and then figure out that, oh, the node is not really, it was never really able to come up on this, uh, on this failed node. Whereas with Kubernetes, we all know that if a node is unhealthy, Kubernetes control plane will never schedule the pod onto an unhealthy node. So it's taken care of automatically. So having evaluated manually managed Kubernetes, manually managed versus Kubernetes, we decided to uh, build the following stack for managing uh, Mac One Metal instances for build workloads uh, orchestrated by a CI orchestrator using the Kubernetes-based framework. So at the top, we have Build Scaler, which is an HPA. So Build Scaler, what it does is it looks at pending builds in your build queue, and it also looks at what percentage of your build agents are busy. And uh, looking at the metrics collected from the build agents, it will scale up number of build agent pods up and down based on uh, pending jobs in the build queue. So if there are, uh, if there is an unexpected spike or if there's a spike in the number of build jobs that have been provisioned, it will uh, increase the number of replicas for the build agent pods up, and it will scale down the build agent pod count down if, if not that many build agents are busy. And going down one level, the next level is uh, nodeless Kubernetes. Nodeless Kubernetes takes care of auto scaling the underlying compute based on pending, pending pods in the control plane. So if there is, an, uh, there is a spike in the pending pods based on what HPA has uh, advised Kubernetes control plane, nodeless Kubernetes will auto scale the Mac 1 metal node 
notes up uh, if there is an increase in the number of pending bill jobs. And the third level is Kubernetes control plane itself, which gives us a lot of the graceful termination and uh, bad node management and monitoring and all of those nice Kubernetes goodness out of the box. And at the fourth level is the Mac one metal node itself. Um, so Mac one metal node, when it's running in the nodeless Kubernetes mode, it is going to run a kubelet stack. So it's going to run a kubelet and a CRI for Mac one metal. And that CRI is going to run your build agent pod. And the build agent pod is going to run both your build agent as well as the flare build executor. Now let's look at each of these four layers in action. So let's start at the HPA Build Scaler. Build Scaler is an open source project from Elotl. Um, the links are provided at the end of this and the, in the final slide. Uh, so here you see that the running job count is listed in red. So you see that uh, the running job count and the total agent count are tracking pretty synchronously, which means that Build Scaler is, is spinning up new agents, uh, creating new agent uh, agent pods based on pending jobs in the build queue. So if there are there is a spike in the number of builds being submitted, new build agents are being uh, created pretty much in sync. So you don't see uh, any, any amount of lag between uh, uh, the build agent pods and the pending builds in the build queue. The second layer is uh, nodeless Kubernetes, where we are going to look at so it provisions just-in-time compute when a pod starts up, and it terminates the compute when the pod terminates. And the stack is comp comprised of uh, of the compute autoscaler that autoscales Mac one uh, metal compute, and the on the node you have um, kubelet plus the CRI that is Mac specific. And there's a it's, it's of course there's a free tier where you can provision and manage up to two Mac one metal instances, the entire Kubernetes stack for free. So now let's look at nodeless Kubernetes, aka Luna, in action. So what we have here is a screenshot of a production um, nodeless Kubernetes and managed Mac One Metal environment, and you see that the the cost, the price of Mac One Metals, is trending up and down based on time of day, day of week, and uh, uh, and day of year as well. So let's try to superimpose what we saw with the HPA, with the pending build jobs and pending Pending, um, pending, pending build pods versus the cost. And you see that when there are more bills, you're paying more. And when there are less bills, you're paying less. So the, the lulls in the bills right here correspond to the low amount of cost that is being, that is being spent on your Mac 1 metal. So the uh, nodeless Kubernetes component is smart enough to understand that your Mac 1 metals are charged at a 24-hour cadence. So it, it does predict that, OK, I've, I have finished my build. I just provisioned my, my, my Mac 1 metal, but there are a lot of pending jobs, so I'm going to keep this Mac 1 Metal instance on and to schedule future builds. So it doesn't churn the Mac 1 Metals as often as it would churn uh, an ARM-based VM or an Intel-based VM. So now look, let's look at the entire thing in action. So we're going to start with looking at build scaler and nodeless Kubernetes, nodeless Kubernetes in action first, and then Zach is going to talk about Flare components and the build uh, Flare build agent and how you're optimally utilizing the compute that you've provisioned for the Mac. Thanks, Zach. So in the top window, we are going to execute the operations in this, um, in this architecture. The bottom left window is where we are going to watch the nodes in the system. The bottom right window, we are going to watch the pods in the system. So we currently have the um, we currently have one Mac one metal that is running in our environment, and we have the Mac autoscaler, which is nodeless Kubernetes component. That's the HPA that is scheduled, that's configured in the environment. So if we look at the HPA, 
Um, the HPA say has a target of 90, and the min number of pods is one, max number of pods is three, and we want to have uh, the current replicas is one. What, is, what that means is that we want the HPA to scale from one pod to three pods. Currently, it is at one spot, one pod, and we want, we want it to perform a scale-up operation if the mean utilization of the build agents is at 90%. So if the mean utilization of the build agents across two build pods or three build pod pods, if it, if it hits 90%, that's when we want to perform the scale-up operation. So um, let's go ahead and schedule a build. Um, if we kick off a build, what we, what we would want to see is that the HPA should realize that, OK, the, a new build came into the build queue, and we want to scale the number of, of the um, of the build pods from one to two because the average utilization of the current build agent should hit should go above 90. Um, so we should let's look at the new pod being scheduled. And if you look at the bottom right window, the pod is in pending state because it doesn't have a Mac one metal compute to run on. So here is when nodeless Kubernetes kicks in and it sees that oh there is a pending pod in the Kubernetes environment and there are no compute nodes available. So it'll go and schedule, a, a create a brand new Mac 1 Metal instance. And that Mac 1 Metal instance, you see in the bottom left window, it's ready. Um, and that's where the, uh, the pod is scheduled. Zach? Yeah, cool. So, so here's a quick look at, um, uh, of course, some of the, the metadata coming out of Bazel. Um, and so here we're, we're taking a look, at, of course, at the CI output here. And so I'll just explain a little bit more about what's going on under the hood. So um, what we see actually happened here was the, uh, the build ran in the CI environment. But it actually, you can see there, if you look closely, 11 actions were executed remotely. Um, so we had a lot of cache hits, because this was a pre-built uh, you know, example here. But uh, we can see that we actually had a lot of, uh, well, 11 actions were executed remotely. Uh, and so this is a build of Bazel itself, the open source project against one of our environments. Um, and so we, we went ahead and clicked a link there to link off into some of our, um, our UI that's actually going to allow us to see a little bit more deeper into what's going on behind the scenes in that Bazel build. So uh, we can see a bunch of metadata about the, the build there, the build logs, um, some, some information about the cache hits uh, and all that stuff. So this is powered by an API built into Bazel to expose that data to us here. So that was an example of like a success case. Um, this is an example of when there's some failures in Bazel. Um, so in, again, in the CI system, uh, we've hooked into some, some lifecycle events in Bazel. We've extracted and actually parsed some of the errors that were um, you know, dumped out during this build, bubbled those up right in front of the user. So in this case, this failed because we tried to execute a macOS build of Bazel without any macOS workers available at all. So of course, the build failed. Um, and so again, clicking that link here, um, we go back in. We see the, you know, the build details here in our platform. Um, um, and we actually see that we extracted this error, so we'll, we'll take a dive in there to, to kind of look at some of the, the information there that we are gathering about errors. So uh, when errors occur in the system, we're actually, um, like I said, we're extracting those uh, with a proprietary algorithm. And we, um, while the stack trace doesn't look great, this is the stack trace that was dumped out of Bazel. Um, and so we're actually kind of cataloging this error. And so we can see, you know, the last time that this, uh, this error was encountered in the system. So it's sort of like, uh, you can think of it like sentry, but uh, for build time errors rather than runtime. So um, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, you know, a quick snapshot of what the UI is able to do and some of the metadata coming out of Bazel. So I'll uh, hand it back over to Madri, I guess, to talk a little bit more about uh, what's going on here. Yeah, so you see that um, you see the build once the build finished on the bottom right window, the build kite, uh, the build uh, agent is terminating. But you might wonder, hey, why is the compute node not being terminated? The, uh, the compute node, the Mac One Metal instance that's provisioned in the bottom left window, it's still in ready state. So Nodeless Kubernetes is smart enough to know that this compute node, Mac One Metal that was provisioned, ha is co going to cost you a dollar an hour uh, for. 24 hours, irrespective of whether you're going to terminate it now or 23 hours later. So based on the pending pods in the uh, in the environment and the past trends, it does try to keep the, met uh, the Mac 1 Metal on for a little longer if it predicts that another new build job is going to come in. And instead of provisioning a, a third Mac 1 Metal, it's going to reuse this existing Mac, Mac 1 Metal. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
So we, we had to extend the monitor instead of mirroring. So that's why we are kind of like trying to figure out what's going on by looking at the screen and not looking at our monitors. Um, any questions about the whole HPA and uh, Mac 1 Metal Management while we figure this out? <laughs> so we are working on supporting M1 instance types that have been coming to market. Uh, so that is a work in progress currently. Uh, we do want to add that support uh, pretty quickly in the environment. So that should be coming out pretty soon as well. Um, so the whole idea of nodeless Kubernetes is is you, at, as the end user of Kubernetes platform, shouldn't worry about what are the new, newer, better kinds of compute shapes coming into market. It's uh, like this. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Um, Zach, you want to talk about what's up in Bazel environment in Flink? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so on, of course, on the future roadmap, um, you know, we've got some items we want to get to at some point. So of course, one of those would be some Bazel specific optimizations for our use case. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is maybe find a way to intelligently share some of the, uh, the Bazel agent outputs directly with the CI job and sort of short circuit some of the round trip network calls. Um, that would make a, maybe a potential impact there. Um, of course, the other big item that we're really excited about is that um, a little open sourced uh, the build scale scalar framework itself um, so that's that's of course super awesome so of course there's a link here we'll share the slides definitely check it out um, and then you know some other stuff of course uh, you know the upcoming m1 support we're super excited about that um, from a basal perspective of course uh, these m1 chips are really really great for for basal builds things are quite a lot faster um, there's of course underlying complications there but we're glad that we've got a little here to, to help us through some of those issues um, so I think that's really it as far as uh, future roadmap from our end. Um, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, that's about it. Um, so build scaler, it, it, it is uh, designed in such a way that you can it, pu it can pull in external metrics from any CI orchestrator. So it, currently it supports build kite, circle CI, and flare build, but it can be extended to any CI, um, any CI metrics provider. So it's it's basically getting in the metrics from the CI agent and and uh, converting it into metrics that can be in, in, injected by the HPA. Cool. Um, yeah, so a few references. Of course, you can find more of our product info uh, out there on the web, on our website. Um, and then, Madri, you want to run us through some of the links here? Yep, yeah, that's about it. Uh, so there's a free tier for Mac 1 Metal Nodeless Kubernetes, like I mentioned earlier. It, you can run it for up to two nodes. So Build Scaler is open source, which is the HPA. That is open sourced. And the free tier for the Mac 1 Metal Compute is open source. So uh, the, the only thing that's not uh, uh, a free tier is, is free, obviously. And the only thing that's not, not open sourced yet is the Mac Autoscaler component. And that is TBD. Uh, cool. Yeah, of course, reach out to us uh, with any questions. Um, you know, we got our emails here. And then I, I know there's some online folks. I don't know if there was meant to be like an online Q&A at all. I don't, I don't know if anyone's monitoring that. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess that's pretty much it, obviously, for our talk. I think come find us after. Uh, we can chat. Do we have time for a quick Q&A here? Yep. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go uh, to the mic, please. Yeah, for, for I the can folks online. your question. So I think the question is, this is primarily for OS X, OS, OS X builds. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the follow-up question is then, in my use case, I've already built my OS X software, but I just want to test the configuration. And so my use case is like to install and reinstall and reinstall the same software. Does this system allow that? to keep reinstalling the software that I have on the Mac hardware? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, this system is basically an application of Kubernetes and nodeless Kubernetes for, for builds. So the way uh, one of the slides that we had in the past uh, talks about the build config. So this one would be. So 
So you see the build agent config where um, you want to be able to, uh, to uh, inject different build agent config in, uh, data into your current pod. That would become much, mu much more easier by using this system than doing it manually because with Kubernetes, you're going to be passing in all the config data as config maps or secrets, stuff like that. So you'll be able to inject varying configurations dynamically at runtime. So I can use the OSX hardware for yes. anything I want to. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great, yeah. great, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, what CRI are we using? So this is a CRI that we built at uh, Elotl for Mac on Metal. So it's a CRI that basically um, takes in, the CRI is basically image service and container service implementations, right? So that talk to the kubelet uh, agent. So the CRI that we built is a custom CRI for Mac, for Mac on Metal. That's part of the, the closed source one, uh, open source uh, strategy TBD. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, so um, are there any plans from your end to support like physical Kubernetes nodes that are running on local hardware or hardware in a data center? Um, because like if, if I have a continuous base load, <clears throat> that will be much, much cheaper than any uh, AWS instance. Yeah, yeah. So the the uh, the nodeless Kubernetes stack, which is comprised of the CRI on the Kubelet node and the autoscaler, are both applicable to on-prem. So they, the stack would work as is on an on-prem uh, data center. Yeah, one, one additional comment I would have on that. So from the Bazel perspective, of course, it's important for us to allow folks that have big existing fleets of Macs to, to bring that um, hardware to our solution. So that's definitely some functionality that's sort of core to our offering. And that's, I think, one of the original reasons we reached out to Alolo is because we were looking for a way to have sort of hybrid cloud setup support out of the box. Uh, do you have uh, AMIs for uh, AWS Mac uh, with pre-built environment for this test? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the nice thing about um, uh, Kubernetes in general and Nodeless in particular is that um, since we can define, hey, I want Xcode vers version ABC and these other build packages or any other dependency packages, um, there are pre-built AMIs already available. So um, if you if you mention the uh, the dependencies that you that are needed for your pod for running the workload in the pod manifest, the right AMI is uh, picked at runtime uh, based on that information. So so it, is it uh, managed by a uh, Flare s system or, or? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you're, if you're, if the AMI is being used for Flare build plus build other kind of build agents, then it's managed by Flare, Flare and us. If you're using it for non-Flare build related uh, use cases, then it would be managed by us. So it's basically um, an AMI that's already in our fleet and we whitelist your, um, your AWS account to consume it. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks so much for joining our talk. Zach and I are super happy to share. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks.